So welcome everybody. Um, so we are a little late, so I will be uh, very short. Um, so Pat Churchland, I guess you all know her, is Professor Emerita at UCSD. She's had a long and exceptionally prolific career in neurophilosophy, a term she herself forged uh, and identified with. Uh, there are many ways to define neurophilosophy. Uh, one uh, is that it provided, it has provided uh, cognitive neuroscience with both the philosophical infrastructure and the philosophical superstructure it needed, I think. So by infrastructure, what I mean here is that Pat Churchman has hugely contributed to the clarification of some conceptual debates that stood in the way of neuroscience if not by solving them, at least by alleviating qualms that scientists would have in the face of bad philosophy, uh, as it is sometimes called. And by superstructure, what I mean is that she has contributed to make neuroscience articulate in public debates and uh, to help it dare say something uh, of so-called philosophical questions. Uh, so our network, the Philin Biomed Network, and the University of Bordeaux in particular, uh, is proud to welcome her here. Um, I am not completely sure that uh, a great part of Pat's work falls within what we call here philosophy in biology and medicine, that is, the use of philosophical tools to solve scientific problems. Uh, but, cl but clearly, very clearly, neurophilosophy is an ally to uh, our uh, cause, so to speak. Um, so Pat has imposed, among other things, the idea that philosophers should know the science they are talking about, um, that they were also contributors and should be contributors to the results of science, and also that they are not useless to scientists themselves. So for that, at least, and for all, also for many other things, we are grateful and we are happy to hear you, Pat. So you, it's the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mayel. And may I just say how thrilled I was um, to learn about your organization and the people uh, involved and the kind of work that's being done. It, uh, I should have known about it long, long ago, but uh, but I didn't. And uh, it it really is a, a great development, and I think really important uh, for showing other philosophers, especially those in in uh, America and England, uh, what really can be done. Now, in the talk today, um, I want to to sort of give a very broad overview of some really surprising things that we have learned about the basis for social behavior, uh, especially in mammals and birds. And uh, so I'm going to start actually, next slide please. I'm going to start with a comment made by Ed Wilson many years ago, which was that the evolution of human sociality is the fundamental conundrum of biology. Now, as you know, he, of course, studied sociality in insects, and Wilson appreciated that sociality in mammals, and in particular in humans, is very different. And it's quite striking that he thought that sociality was such a conundrum uh, in 1975, and by now, uh, the research has shown us quite a lot about the neurobiological basis for sociality. Next slide. Now, in order to sort of address why Wilson thought it was such a deep conundrum, I want to start by thinking about the very deepest level of value in all organisms. And that is that they are oriented towards their own welfare. They are wired up in such a way as to see to their own survival and well being. Otherwise, of course, they don't reproduce and uh, their genes would not go to the next generation. So, self care is a very, very deep value. Now, next slide. Biologists who recognize this. Uh, then had a very difficult time trying to explain social behavior and in particular altruism. 
where one incurs a cost to oneself in order to help another. And in his early book, The Selfish Gene, Richard Dawkins took the view that we are all fundamentally selfish and that in order to have social properties that are conducive to welfare of all, we have to kind of beat it into our children. And uh, we, we are born essentially selfish. And this caused a great deal of difficulty for biologists because mostly they thought in terms of a gene or two that might be modified to make some individual altruistic. But if that happened, the others would take advantage and the altruistic genes would not be passed on. And so they concluded, as did Dawkins, that we are fundamentally selfish. Next slide. Now, it's very interesting to me that Darwin, who was such a keen observer in the, in the wild of all of us, um, that Darwin took a very different view. And in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, Darwin made the following observation, that our moral sense or our conscience depends on three things, on social instinct meaning we are social by nature. It also depends on habits and skills that are acquired after birth, and it depends on problem solving when the ecology in one way or another changes and a problem uh, needs to be addressed. Interestingly, this is also the view in, in historical philosophers of, of people such as Aristotle, Confucius, and the two great Scotsmen, David Hume and Adam Smith. Now, Darwin couldn't, of course, address either the nature of the genes that might be involved or the nature of the neural, neuronal wiring that might be um, involved in conscience. Next slide. But along with uh, many contemporary uh, ethologists, uh, we have seen that there are, are all kinds of social behaviors, some of which have uh, analogs, at least in the case of humans. We see consolation after a loss, reconciliation after a struggle. We see pro-social choice, meaning that animals may, for example, share food. We see orphan adoption. Of, of children or, or infant chimpanzees or even infant rats. We see empathy, third party punishment, fairness, self-control, cooperation, and reasoning. And these are seen in mammals, but they're also seen extensively in birds. In addition to the ethologists, next slide, it's important that anthropologists have given us a much deeper view of humans by discovering that there are many species of hominin that lived uh, concurrently in some cases with Homo sapiens, but long before. And in particular, we know, for example, that Homo erectus was around on the planet for about 1.8 million years. Homo sapiens is only about 300,000 years. And that Homo erectus clearly lived in small groups. They made stone tools. They had the controlled use of fire. And so social instincts almost certainly are to be found in humans and in hominins going a long way back. Next slide. Now, when, when Ed Wilson raised the question about sociality in humans, of course, he understood so much about sociality in insects. And we know that there are also social fish. And, and here we see bees and, and uh, discus fish. And their social behavior can be really quite complex. However, it appears largely tied uh, to the genes. And so that much about the wiring for sociality in, in social insects and fish is determined uh, by, the gen, by the genes. Next slide. Now, about 200 million years ago, something very important happened on the planet. 
And that is that endotherms appear, that is animals who could generate uh, their own heat. And it was very important uh, for the endotherms because what they could do would be to forage at night when the cold blooded animals had to wait for the sun to come up. It was a tremendous advantage, but of course, often in evolution, as we know, uh, something that can be advantageous, but also carry a cost. And in this instance, the cost had to do with energy. So gram for gram, a warm blooded animal needs 10 times the calories of its cold blooded cousins. And that put a huge ecological constraint on the capacity of endotherms. Next slide. Now, in ways that we do not yet clearly understand, what happened in mammals, all mammals, is that a very new structure appeared, and that was the cortex. And you can see it outlined in purple on, on a slice and the drawing indicating the five to six to maybe even seven layers that uh, is typical of cortex. Uh, just as an aside, I should say birds do have a kind of cortex as it is now, as we now know, it didn't look like it, but, and that's because it doesn't have quite the same appearance uh, under the microscope, but the wiring is essentially uh, comparable. So cortex appeared. Now, the thing about cortex is that uh, it allows you to learn a tremendous amount of stuff about your environment. But if you're going to learn, then of course, structure has to be built, which means that the cortex in particular, but other structures too, need to be very immature at birth. Next slide. And in this slide, what you see are newborn rats. You can see that they're hairless, so they can't even keep themselves warm. They are blind. All they can do really is rely on their wiring to scrabble around, find something warm that sticks out and suck on it. Next slide. So in this slide, this just reinforces the point that learning any learning involves building structure. And in particular, if the cortex is going to learn a massive amount about the animal's environment, it needs to be very immature at birth. And you can see that there are the neurons and even at one month, you see sprouting nine months, the dendrites and the axons proliferate. And at two years, there is tremendous pro pro proliferation. There is, of course, a kind of pruning back in adolescence. It's not shown here. So in order then, next slide. In order to deal with this problem of uh, getting extra calories because you're warm blooded, what we see are these two really important developments. The learning capacity goes way up, but neonatal independence goes way down. So a turtle can scramble out of its egg, hike down to the water, and begin a life where it can feed itself. That's not true of any mammal or any bird. Some birds and some mammals can walk like uh, a, 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 a baby deer, a fawn, uh, but they actually are dependent on the mother uh, for milk. So uh, next slide. So the amazing thing that we see in mammals and birds is an expansion of the domain where the brain manages well-being. That is to say, Mother Nature realized that it's great to have, if I may be anthropomorphic, it's great to have this highly immature cortex that will learn about the animal's world, but it has to have somebody take care of it. Who's around to take care of it? The mom. The mom is given birth, the mom is there. And so what we see is that, if I can put it somewhat metaphorically, it's as though the domain where I manage my own warmth and food and safety that domain expands to include me and mine. 
So it's not just me, 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 as, as Richard Dawkins thought, it's me and mine. Now, how is this achieved in the brain? That is, how do we get beyond, if we're mother nature, how did mother nature figure out how to get beyond purely me? Next slide. And the answer, and I'm going to simplify here, the answer, of course, is, is complicated and depends on many neurochemicals that affect wiring and also some new wiring. But the particular neurochemical that is crucially important, and that I'm going to focus on here, is oxytocin. So when the baby is born, there is a rush of oxytocin into the brain of the mother. And she feels for this squirming, this often really quite funny looking thing, she feels a huge attachment. She is strongly bonded to that infant. And as the infant cuddles and gets milk and is warm and safe, the infant has a rush of oxytocin in its brain. So it is bonded to the mother and the mother is bonded to that, to the baby. Next slide. So what is this, what is the story then about oxytocin? Where in the brain does it come from? How does it have its effect? Now, in this slide, what you're looking at on the left is, um, is a tiny, a uh, little bit of hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is, of course, a very ancient structure, unlike cortex. And you can see that in, in the uh, blown up diagram, that there are essentially two structures within the hypothalamus that release oxytocin. And notice that they both release oxytocin into the pituitary as well as into the brain. And the release into the brain also goes to ancient structures and not shown here, but it also goes to cortex. And in particular, it goes to the reward system so that uh, the reward system responds to oxytocin when there is a positive experience. Next slide. So just to, cause I, I, I I want to be as clear as possible. You might ask at this point, so, so what's the link to morality? What's the connection between oxytocin, mothers, and morality? And the answer is basically that sociality begets other caring. Other caring along with social learning give rise to social norms about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And finally, problem solving in an ecology allows for norm changes when things change or when there is suffering or there is a, a problem, then problem solving kicks in. And notice how those kind of link up to the early ideas um, of Darwin. But now I want to go beyond the mother infant bonding and talk about bonding to others and bonding within a group. All right, next slide. So here we're going to talk about prairie voles, but first let me tell you about a distinction that's really important between kinds of voles. So there are many kinds of voles. Montane voles live in the mountains, they, they uh, scurry under rocks and build their nests. And in the case of montane voles, the male and the female meet they mate, and then they go their separate ways. She's going to have the babies. He's going to have more action. Prairie voles are very different. Two young prairie voles meet, they mate, and now they're bonded forever. And what does that mean exactly? And here the behavioral studies have been very uh, illuminating. So in this particular slide, what you see are a pair of prairie voles. The male is hovering over the babies. So he helps take care of the babies. He helps keep them warm. He defends the nest against intruders, including other females. And uh, he takes care of the babies when the female has to be off uh, foraging for food. 
Now, when this was discovered, people wondered, well, that's a really different behavior between prairie voles and montane voles. What explains the difference? Next slide. And in, in work done uh, in many labs, but I'm gonna focus on the work in Larry Young's lab in Emory in Atlanta. Um, it turned out that oxytocin plays the critical role in whether animals bond or not. But oxytocin can only have a role if there are receptors for the oxytocin to bind to. So what you see in this particular slide are slices of vole brain, montane voles and prairie voles. And they are stained for, in the one case, oxytocin receptors, and in the other case, vasopressin receptors. And here's what you notice. Now the stain will show uh, dark. So here in the prairie vole, in a very important part of the reward system, the nucleus accumbens, you see a high density of receptors for oxytocin. That is not seen in the nucleus accumbens of uh, montane voles. Vasopressin, which is sometimes referred to as a sibling peptide of oxytocin. It differs in only two uh, amino acids. Vasopressin is also found, uh, receptors for vasopressin in the uh, reward area of the lateral, uh, the ventral pallidum in the prairie vole, but not in the ventral pallidum of the montane vole. Notice that you do see quite a, a dark staining for receptors for vasopressin in the lateral septum. And it turns out that oxytocin receptors there, given the wiring, actually inhibit sociality. Next slide. So uh, the way to, to view this result is, is that we can uh, understand the bonding between male and female prairie voles in terms of uh, the wiring and the density of oxytocin receptors. I should, of course, indicate that Larry Young's lab did all of the manipulations to be sure that this is a causal and not just a, correla uh, um, a correlation between oxytocin receptor density and social behavior. So uh, it's also important, next slide, not just that you have a high density of receptors for oxytocin, but that they are in regions where there is uh, an, an, a component of the reward system so that the animal feels pleasure as a result of an interaction. And in, in this, um, cartoon of, of a rat brain, what we can see is that the endogenous opioids uh, are all over the, the, uh, the brain, but in the ventral tegmental area in particular and in the nucleus accumbens, we see really quite a high density. But there's also an important role for the endocannabinoids. So there's clearly uh, an important link between certain kinds of social behavior, the release of oxytocin, and the feeling of well-being or pleasure. Next slide. Now, that kind of takes us then from just mothers and babies bonding to adults bonding and being uh, bonded for long periods of time to perhaps bonding not necessarily with a mate, but with kin or with friends and so forth. And the hypothesis is that depending on the species, of course, many species are not long-term pair bonders, but if they are a highly social species, they usually have quite strong bonds, for example, to kin in the case of, of baboons. And it's not just primates where we see these uh, strong bonding behaviors. They are also seen in, in rats um, and 
All right. So I want just to say a little bit more about the brain organization. So this is um, next slide, please. This is a cartoon uh, version, but what you're seeing is that part of the hypothalamus from which um, oxytocin is released, the paraventricular nucleus. And you can see that it sends um, oxytocin to the ventral tegmental area, which is crucial in the reward system and the nucleus accumbens in the reward system. Also notice that it sends uh, signals to the amygdala. And because this is a rat, not surprisingly, uh, we see signals in the olfactory bulb. Um, now, a recent, next slide please, a recent discovery, which I thought was particularly interesting about the role of oxytocin in, in wider regions of the brain, of the cortex, not just, for example, in frontal structures, which can be understood as part of the reward system. But Pitcher and Leslie Ungerleiter uh, published a, an important paper showing that in visual cortex, there is, in addition to the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway, uh, the so-called where and what pathways, there is a specifically social pathway where neurons respond to uh, social signals, social movement, for example, facial expressions, shifts in eye gaze or uh, shifts in, in um, movements of the mouth, or if, if you're an animal that can move your ears, uh, shifts in ear position. So, so the cortex is clearly also very much involved um, in sociality. Now, I should probably say that not, not a great deal is known about the location of oxytocin receptors in human cortex or in human brains in general. And that's because in order to identify those areas that have high densities of, of receptors, you have to introduce a stain into the system, and then you have to sacrifice the animal and cut the brain into slices. And obviously we don't do that with, with humans. Nevertheless, there are two individuals who um, came to autopsy very quickly after death and in those individuals, uh, only two <laughs> so far, um, we, we see really surprising amounts of oxytocin receptors uh, in frontal cortex. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, sometimes it's, uh, it has been noticed again by ethologists that food sharing by animals raises the level of oxytocin in, in the brain. And the hypothesis about this, and, and perhaps this is why it's not surprising that we see a certain amount of food sharing, especially when food is, is relatively plentiful in lots and lots of uh, mammalian species. The, the hypothesis is that this is really kind of an extension of the mechanisms that support mother-infant bonding during lactation. That's the sort of ground level of food sharing and that food sharing in other conditions uh, sort of draws upon the wiring uh, in that case. Oxytocin is not just involved in uh, social behavior, but uh, in social behavior, we do see things like um, decrease in defensiveness. Uh, there is a very important relationship between stress hormones and oxytocin. So when stress hormones go up, oxytocin levels tend to decline by and large. And when oxytocin levels go up, stress hormones go down. And this is, I, I think, particularly, next slide, important um, to help us understand some of the great difficulties that people have encountered in isolation 
during, um, during this COVID-19 epidemic. Next slide. There have been lots and lots of experiments to try to understand the role of oxytocin in humans. One, for example, shows that if you use a blood pressure cuff to uh, cause a certain amount of pain, and of course the pain gets a little bit uh, worse as time goes on, um, we can ask, for example, before the individuals undergo the, uh, the tourniquet, we can ask them if they would like to donate some money to uh, a charity or if they would like to keep their payment for themselves. And what we notice is that for those who prefer to donate, they have lower degrees of pain than those uh, who prefer not to. Now, in animal studies, I think we have also learned some really important things about the nature of social interactions and social behavior. And I want to mention this slide, uh, next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, the studies that can be done on, on um, rats and mice have revealed some very important things about the role of oxytocin in early experience. So these would, uh, these would be mice and the, the mice are handled almost not at all and they have low parental care. We, the, the mice are, are taken in little cups out of the nest, they're kept warm and fed, and then after a while, many hours, they may be put back in the nest. So that's the experimental situation. What you see under those conditions is something really rather striking, and that is in the genes for oxytocin receptors, there is DNA methylation. And what that means then is that there is decreased gene expression of the protein for oxytocin receptors. And that of course implies that since there are fewer receptors, there is decreased binding to receptors. And finally, it means that at the level of social behavior, there is a difference between these animals and animals that have a normal upbringing. And essentially one important difference is that they're not very social and they do not make, if they're females, they do not make good mothers. Next slide. As I indicated earlier, there is this inverse relationship between oxytocin and stress hormones like cortisol. And Almost certainly when animals can trust and like each other, a certain kind of cooperation can emerge. And then that is sort of self-reinforcing. And this is, is just a picture of, of individuals who are cooperating um, to build igloos in, in the North. Cooperation, of course, next slide, is seen in many, many species. And, and here, I, I think, Wolves and dogs are particularly remarkable in the kinds of cooperation and the social signals that they send to each other. This slide is really rather disturbing in a way if, if you take the point of view of the moose, but not so if you take the point of view of, of the wolves. But you can see that they have surrounded the cow moose and, and her calf. And they're very, very adept at bringing down a large animal who could kill them with a, a good swift kick. But they're very good at it. They uh, watch intently what each other is doing. They send signals sometimes verbally, but also just by virtue of bodily movement. And these are picked up perhaps by that uh, stream we saw that uh, is, is in visual cortex and they will be very successful in bringing down the, the, the cow moose, but also the baby. Next slide. Now, um, I have tried to present a kind of simple storyline here, but uh, of course, it's much more complex than, than I, 
I can present in, in 45 minutes or an hour. And also, it, I think emphasizes something that many moral philosophers have understood for a very long time. And that is that we do not live by simple rules. That sometimes we pretend that a simple rule like the 10 commandments or a simple rule like um, uh, utilitarianism will work. But of course, everyone knows that there are exceptions and that you have to, be more sensitive uh, than what those simple rules would suggest. And it's complex because norms conflict with preferences, they conflict with each other, they vary across individual, they vary within an individual across time. And there's much that we don't understand about social behavior and adhering to norms. But I think the philosophical work on the part of utilitarians, for example, has really masked the tremendous complexity that goes into social behavior uh, in humans and other animals. Next slide. So um, I've tried to sort of give you a bit of a feel for a range of sciences that have contributed to our current understanding about the nature of the foundation for morality. And of course, there's a, a great deal more to be done. Next slide. And one thing that I think is, is really quite striking is, is how complex uh, mammalian brains and avian brains really are. And it means that pictures like this are not all that rare. Um, if we go on to YouTube, you find birds being helped by dogs. In this case, the dog and the monkey are helping each, uh, or at least the dog is helping the monkey, giving the monkey uh, a ride. Uh, we used to think these things were extremely rare, but they're rare only in uh, particularly harsh, harsh conditions. And I'm going to end, um, oh, ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Next two slides, actually. There's the book that, that um, uh, I, my most recent book that discusses all this, but go to the next slide and I'm gonna make this one my last slide. So how do we raise levels of brain oxytocin? And it's interesting that physical exercise will do it, social interactions of course, and social touch. So with that, I want to conclude. And I think um, I'm happy to answer questions. And perhaps what I can do is just shift my um, slides around so that I can see you and you can see me. OK. Great. Thank you very much, Pat. That was really a great talk. I've learned a lot of things and I have questions, but I will leave yes. the room for others to ask theirs. Uh, so to do so, please uh, use the, um, the chat. Okay, I should open it myself first. Um, well, I cannot see, ah, oh, yes, it's here. Okay, so you can either raise your hand in the participant box or chat, or uh, yeah, well, I think it's the best option because there are too many people for me to see if uh, anyone is raising their hands physically. So please use the uh, participant chat if you have any question. Thomas, could you see questions in the, the other? Oh yeah, there, there are questions in the chat, I suppose. From Attila uh, to the other box. Okay, so one uh, question first. Uh, so I assume most of the, I'm reading the question. I assume most of the data you showed are um, wrong female animals. What about males? Oh yes, no, very good question. No, no, um, in the case, for example, of the prairie voles, um, where you saw the brain slice, those were, um, those were males. 
So yes, males have a tremendous amount of oxytocin. Uh, human males have, have a lot of oxytocin receptors as well. Absolutely. Yeah. No, um, exactly why that is, um, I'm not sure, but, but it's, it's clear that, um, that males of many species, even if they are not long-term pair bonders, um, may care about, about their infants. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Second question. So great talks. Thanks. I'm wondering how do we get from oxytocin to moral intuitions? Can you elaborate? Well, I think I think of it sort of this way, and, and I would be grateful for, for additional ideas. I think of the, the oxytocin story as providing the kind of platform for social behavior in general and social behavior where, where that is positive. Um, that is not social behavior where people are beating each other up. Um, and uh, so, so the question really is, uh, what does this platform do? And the answer is, it, it allows for the learning of habits and skills for getting along in a social environment, of learning how to behave in order to get along. And bear in mind that this is the reward system that is full of oxytocin receptors. And the reward system is responding positively and giving you reinforcement when you do a nice thing or when you behave in the appropriate way and you fail to get reinforcement, you may actually get punishment uh, when you do something uh, that is wrong or hurtful and so forth. So this is the part of the story that involves skills and habits and learning where many of these social behaviors become just second nature to us. Um, and, and then more reflective aspects of the story may come in where we need to change social norms, where, uh, for example, there is tremendous food scarcity. And so we have to figure out how to change our norms in order to accommodate uh, the current situation. Now, of course, bear in mind too that, that the, the brain of homo sapiens and brain of hominids involved, uh, uh, evolved rather in, in conditions of small hunter gatherer groups. We don't really see that there is much in the way of fundamental changes in the, in the brain of homo sapiens once they began to congregate in large groups. And bear in mind that only happened about 10,000 years ago. So for most of our history, We've lived in these small, small groups. Now, things did change quite fundamentally with the advent of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. And that's when you begin to see these large settlements where big thing, not everybody knows everybody else or not everybody can really be counted on as a friend. And when that happens, norms begin to emerge that involve uh, something that you didn't even need if you were an Eskimo, for example, uh, living in a group of 15 people. And I mean, for example, I think it's quite interesting in the case of the Inuit that they didn't really have in their groups a tribal leader. I mean, what they had was the guy who was the best hunter and he took them hunting and the guy who was the best kayaker and he took them kayaking and the guy who was really good at, or the woman maybe was really good at building igloos and she kind of organized that. But once you get these really big groups where not everybody knows everybody else, you see this emergence of the king and all kinds of things changed as a result. So related to that question is, the, the next question is, how do you account for the huge variation in social norms among humans? So you have answered part of, uh, of that question, but maybe yeah. you want to add something. Well, 
is the variability so big? Doesn't look to me like it's very big at all. I mean, on fundamental issues, it seems that we're pretty much alike. By and large, humans really care about their mates and they really care about their offspring. And they care quite a bit about their kin and they may care a certain amount about their neighbors and their friends, but not as deeply or with as much commitment as their mates, their children, and their kin. That's just about seen everywhere. Now, it's trivial whether you eat with your hands or a pair of sticks or, you know, a knife. Uh, that isn't a really big norm. Um, so we do see big variations in table matters, but I regard that as kind of trivial. Uh, but, but by and large, lying is always frowned upon. I mean, it was very interesting, again, to me, the Inuit, very interesting here. They considered deception and lying to be far more serious than murder. They didn't have that many murders. They would had found ways to get along. Um, but deception and lying was the worst thing you could do. But all cultures consider lying to be a bad thing. I don't know of any culture who says, yeah, go for it. I mean, you know, within a small group, they might be willing to lie to the other groups, but within the group, they don't lie. They do keep their promises uh, and so forth. So I don't see that much variability. I mean, I used to, when I was a kid and I, uh, you know, we didn't have television or anything like that out in the farm. So I used to look at National Geographics and I found it just shocking to see these pictures of women in Africa who covered their legs, but their tops were all uncovered. And that seemed to me to be a deep difference. It's not a deep difference. It's a trivial difference. The really significant moral differences have to do with, with how we treat each other, whether we're willing to help, whether we're willing to undertake third party punishment for bad behavior and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is, do ants have oxytocin to drive socially? You know, it's a really interesting question and people are now looking at, um, at insects to try to understand whether or not there is a role for oxytocin in social behavior. And my understanding is that they are finding it. Um, now oxytocin, of course, does all many, many things. I didn't mention in the talk, but in, in the body, you saw the slide where oxytocin is released into the pituitary. So where does it go? Well, it goes all over the place. In men, it goes to the testes. In women, it goes to the ovaries. And it's responsible for a uh, part of the uh, ovulation process. It goes to the gut. It goes to the heart. So it's a very, very ancient molecule. And it looks like, you know, depending on where you put the receptors, it can play an interesting role or not. And the thing about mammals and birds is that the receptors got put into the reward system and into cortex. And that seems to be the critical part of, of the story. But I can't fully answer your question about insects, but it's spot on. Great question. Thank you. So the next question is about, uh, so you have shown that a methylation of the oxytocin gene during childhood leads to consequences in adulthood on behavior and perhaps morality. Uh, from this perspective, how then to explain the psychological concept of resilience during adulthood? Uh, I guess I'm not quite sure. I mean, <laughs> Of course, there's great variability between individuals in, um, in, in mammals. And so there may be some individuals who can, can undergo strong methylation of, of the gene 
for the oxytocin receptor and still be resilient. But I don't think we know that in the case of humans. I think in the case of humans, what we do know is that children can be kind of severely treated and managed nonetheless. But I don't think that's because their oxytocin receptors didn't get methylated, although you know that could be part of the story too. But you also need to bear in mind that now that people are looking very, very closely at um, SNPs in oxytocin receptors, we see that there are variants of um, the oxytocin gene. And, um, and, and that means that there are variants in the receptors also. So there's lots, lots and lots of the story that we still don't really have in, in sufficient detail. But it's a very interesting question, actually. Next, next one is um, uh, oxytocin increases in-group socia sociality at the expense of out-group sociality, 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 sorry. Uh, wouldn't oxytocin promote xenophobia in this case? You know, yeah, there there was this data from De Drew showing that <clears throat> that um, in group, if, if if you spray oxytocin up the nose, um, that you get in group tighter bonding and um, and hostility to the out group. I always kind of wondered about whether that was really true or not. For one thing, there, <laughs> there's kind of a story here that, that I think has, is philosophically kind of interesting. But early on, I think Ernst Fair's lab in Zurich was the first to do this. People started, thought, well, geez, you know, we could change uh, human behavior by giving them oxytocin, how can we do that? Well, how we do it in, in uh, rats and mice is you inject it directly into the brain. Well, you can't do that with humans. And so they thought, well, maybe, maybe it's like cocaine, right? You know, you put it up the nose, you sniff, and it goes into the brain. And so, so Ernst Fayer's lab did that. They were the first, and, then, and they got results that indicated greater degrees of sociality. And so people all, all around the world began spraying oxytocin up the nose. Now, it turns out <laughs> that oxytocin does not cross the blood-brain barrier. Huh, really? So what's the story on these results? Now, I, when I say it doesn't cross it, I, I have to modify that. It can be ferried across by certain special transporter molecules, but it's a slow and time-limited, rate-limited business. So eventually, actually, Ernst Fair's lab retracted their paper, but other people kept doing it, and they didn't have very big numbers. And De Drew's result about in-group strength and out-group hostility is a case in point. I don't know, maybe you had 15 people or something. That's just not enough. So what do we make of the fact that lots of people seem to be getting results, just spraying oxytocin up the nose? And, and so people are looking now very hard at other routes that might be taken by oxytocin rather than just you know, going, going through the uh, blood brain bar through the epithelium and the blood brain barrier. And it's really not understood very well at this point. There could be a route that goes through the, uh, the little bones in the nose and cribriform plate and then into the olfactory system, and that then finds its way from the olfactory system into other parts of the brain. That's a possibility, and there's some evidence in, in favor of it. But um, I, I would be very, very skeptical of the De Drew results showing outgroup hostility. Um, and uh, it might happen, but... <sighs> That, and, and it's embarrassing to me that that result has been um, referenced uh, again and again and again in articles, and I just don't think it's believable. 
it might be true. I'd like to see them repeat it with a, you know, with 50 guys. By the way, notice that I'm saying guys. Why? Why were they all men? Well, the answer, of course, is that we discovered that if you put oxytocin directly into the brain of female rats, they immediately go into estrus. Well, you don't want to be taking 50 college girls and giving them oxytocin when it does go into the brain and they all go into estrus. That's not, you don't really want to be messing with their cycling. So it's all been done on men. <laughs> so that adds an additional sort of funny factor to, to, to this story. But I'm sorry, that's a long-winded answer to a very interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. Any idea as to why physical exercise would raise oxytocin levels? Does it confer an evolutionary advantage that would have been selected or might it be simply an accidental benefit collateral effect, beneficial collateral effect or something or something else? It's a really interesting question and I don't have the answer. And um, somebody may have published an answer to that, um, but I don't know. Um, it, it, it could be that it has something to do with um, the pleasurable effect of physical exercise and the need for mothers to take their babies with them. I mean, I'm thinking of hunter-gatherer groups again, Hunt, taking their babies with them when, when the babies are very small or something. I don't know, I'm making it up, uh, <laughs> but I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but it's interesting. You know, you feel crappy, you feel angry, you feel depressed, go for a run. And yeah. Next question. I'm very curious to about the extent to which isolation has been harmful do, during confinement. Uh, do you think that stress oxytocin is sufficient to explain the serious health deterioration we have seen recently? I don't think it's it's the only factor. I think there are complicating factors, um, but uh, it does seem that individuals who are otherwise quite well cared for uh, really feel a profound loss when they don't have have social interactions. But of course. Again, you know, humans vary quite a lot on on the spectrum of how much how much social interaction they they actually need. Um, you know, there there are those trappers in Canada who used to go off for months and months with just their dogs. But of course, dogs are great social companions. Anyway, yeah. Uh, is the oxytocin response a learned response or instinctual response? In which case, where is the relevance of learning in the moral response? Well, of course, you know, learning and, and uh, being innate, those things are intimately connected. And uh, so, so you can be wired up as babies are to take pleasure when they suckle and when they are when there's skin skin attachment and so forth the skin skin uh, touching and oxytocin is certainly released but bear in mind oxytocin is released and goes to many places in the reward system so it's rewarding it's pleasurable um, and uh, but but social behavior in mammals and birds, of course, involves learning a huge amount about the physical world, but also about the social world. And, and, and it's, it's true of all mammals that they learn quite a lot about the social world. Now, some mammals are essentially loners, like for example, uh, polar bears or, or grizzly bears. But they, the, the, the babies learn a lot from their mother about how to behave, how to hunt, how to be quiet, how to hide. And, um, and you know, there's lots of, of YouTube videos on this where you can see the mother um, will be trying to get a prey, in, in, in case I'm thinking about it, it's an elk. 
and and the babies she signals to them to move away move away but to watch and uh, so so is that kind of social behavior absolutely if 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 they don't do what she says she may not get the prey and or the prey you know may kill them so there's a huge huge requirement um, for learning in in the case of 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 norms but you know i don't really make too much of a distinction except sort of for conversation if you like between moral norms and and, and social norms and norms for for how to how to behave in the physical world I, mean, I think it's all a big continuum and for convenience we may focus on social norms but there are those philosophers like the utilitarians who think that social norms are in a class by themselves oh nuts um you can organize norms perhaps by degree of seriousness or you know degree of social relevance or something but Morality is not in a class by itself. It's part of social behavior and social behavior is part of what we need to have in order to get along in our physical world. So that's related to the next question, which is when we think about Western moral philosophy theories, we often think about it in the normativist aspect. How is your approach handling the uh, is out problem of evolutionary ethics? Do you consider your theory to be only descriptive in its nature, or is there any normative aspect to it? Well, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, you know, when you think about the nature of value in general, and think about that first slide where we talked about the deepest level of value has to do with seeing to one's own welfare, seeing to one's own well-being, food, warmth, and safety. Um, is that a choice? Oh, not a, no, not really. I mean, that's a, babies are born that way. And they're also born to be very attached to their parents. And they are, you know, given normal, given normal circumstances, they are. Baby birds are very attached to their parents. Baby, baby ducks, baby rabbits. Um, is that a is that a choice? Well, geez, I mean, hardly. I mean, it's not not like a, a a choice about you know should I put the nest here or there. Um, so you know, a long time ago, I guess it was in the early part of the twentieth century. G. E. Moore made this distinction between there's fact and there's value and and you know never the twain shall meet and uh, and i think well not really it's a fact that we are wired to value our own welfare it's a fact that mammals are wired to value the well-being of their offspring um, now, there are other values like, you know, should I have a one piece uh, bathing suit or a bikini? Well, you know, that's not really a very important value for one thing, and it may vary across cultures or across families or whatever, but that's not the really, really important stuff. Values are built into the wiring. And and then once you've got it built into the wiring, that means that the offspring develop in certain ways rather than in other ways. So, so yeah, you know, I, I think this is one place where there are these kind of dogmas in philosophy. And I think one of the dogmas is this, this crap about facts are facts and values are values. And yeah, up to a point, but no, not entirely true. Um, otherwise, I don't know how to make sense of, of, of the point that it is a fact that animals are wired to see to their own welfare. I don't know how to, how, how do you make sense of that? Gee, Moore. <laughs> Yeah, so, so anyway, I mean, one of the things that really intrigues me about this group that you have is how 
you guys are coming to think about some of these old, you know, standard stories about epistemology and morality and metaphysics that look funny in the context of science. They just don't, they, they just don't look like they can hold water. So the next question, again, a question by a philosopher, I suppose, do you think that we can elaborate a moral system or rules from our natural moral intuitions or that such a thing is not necessary or at least or that at least knowing our natural tendencies in the moral realm is necessary to build morals in philosophy yeah i think you do have to take into account um our nature in order to uh, have a social system that, that is successful. And in a very complex social environment, as, as uh, many, many societies on the planet now are, you do, because not, not everybody knows everybody else and because people can't uh, be counted on to, to adhere to, to norms, you do have to have something like settled rules about what is unacceptable. And of course, what's so interesting is, is to look at how these rules about, uh, that became laws, I guess you might say, all, how these laws uh, are oriented in very early hunter, or uh, very early farming communities. And, um, it tells you something about the practical nature of the law. So sometimes we do, since we live in these very complex societies, we do have to have laws about, for example, on what side of the road you drive, um, or laws about what, what happens to you if you intentionally murder somebody. But many of the social norms that we live by, we can't even articulate. They are deep, deep into the reward system. And we just behave in certain ways that seem to us intuitive and obvious because we learned so long ago, lots and lots of it learned before we even had, uh, had a language. And so our impulses can, can drive us most of the time, but occasionally, we have to sort of sit back and think, well, geez, now what? Um, and in our, for example, in our current political situation in the US, there's these disagreements about whether or not um, Trump uh, should be uh, held to the criminal code or whether he should be forgiven and, and we should move on. And I don't think those are easy. I think they're really hard. And I don't have any rule that tells me how to decide those things. We have to get together and talk about it and scratch our noggins and yeah, it's hard. I think moral philosophers by and large with the exception of Hume and Aristotle have totally misunderstood the complexity of social behavior. And, and current moral philosophers, um, the ones that I happen to know, I'm sure there's lots that, that are, are better, but the ones that I happen to know are, are it, 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 it's just kind of a waste of time what they're doing. Yeah. Next question. I'm wondering if a distinction can be drawn between reward systems like the oxytocin system and moral intuitions. So even if we, can, if we get positive outcomes from such reward systems that may not coincide with moral intuitions, is there a risk that this kind of account requires a deflationary view about morality? Um, well, I mean, the reward system is there. <laughs> and the reward system is engaged when you are learning and you perform a certain kind of social behavior and you get rewarded for it. Um, I mean, that's just how it works. Um, now we can, because we have these cortical structures in, in addition, we can sometimes ask about whether what we learned as a child uh, could be 
whether whether it's really the best way to go about things. And I think people do do that. But uh, I, I mean, moral intuition, what is moral intuition? Well, it's, yeah, as far as I can tell, what that means is it's my sort of instantaneous, unreflective feeling about what's right or wrong in a cer certain situation. Well, that comes from deep learning, right? That comes from having uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental wiring in place and then learning as a child that certain things are right or certain things are wrong. So I have this moral intuition and then somebody says, yeah, but you know, maybe you shouldn't do it that way. You should do it this way. And then I might think about it. But moral intuition is just a response that your brain makes on the basis of many factors that go into the reward system interacting with cortex. I mean, this is a brain phenomenon, moral intuition. It isn't something else. That's what your brain does. Um, and so I don't think that's necessarily a very satisfactory answer. Um, but uh, moral intuition isn't some pure thing that, that, you know, is unaffected by your experience and what you've learned and so forth. It isn't unaffected by your reward system or your prefrontal cortex. I mean, I, I, I actually kind of, you know, reflecting on, on Ed Wilson, I think that there's much still in his appreciation of the complexity of social behavior. I think it's incredibly complicated. It seems to us often to be easy because we're wired that way. The things that are hard are the things that we're not wired for. Yeah. Okay, next question. I'm sorry, I won't be able, I guess, to ask all the questions because we have already, we have- Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, my answers have been too long. No, oh, you know, I mean, there are very many questions. At least I have, I can see at least 16 other questions and there are almost 20 questions. So obviously uh, the problem is not that you, you took time to, to answer them. Uh, so the next one, I, I won't be able to make a selection and that would be unfair. Um, is um, okay, your work is known to be related to eliminative materialism, but would you call yourself a naturalist? So it's a general well, question. Yeah, I mean, first of all, eliminative materialism is just a hypothesis about the nature of representations. And the hypothesis is that by and large, our representations are not lingua form. They're not sort of in the way that Jerry Fodor thought about beliefs, namely they're, they're essentially linguistic. And the hypothesis is that we can have all kinds of complicated knowledge, spatial knowledge, for example, that doesn't conform to that account of beliefs. Now, eliminative materialism then is really only a hypothesis about representations and it's, uh, I, I just got to mention this because people are often confused about it. It doesn't say that there's no such thing as consciousness, for example. Um, so, so, uh, so having said that, then the second part of the question is, am I a naturalist? Well, I don't actually, I've sort of given up on isms and ists. I, I, I don't know what the heck I am. I mean, I have certain ideas about things in the social domain, namely that uh, oxytocin plays a critical role. There are many other neurochemicals that do also that uh, we see in humans long-term pair bonding. Sometimes it's serial, but humans by and large uh, form long-term bonds. By and large, we care very much about our children and our mates and our, our friends and our kin that um, now does that make me a, a, a naturalist? I have the faintest idea. Um, so I, I, I don't think 
I don't think the isms have served philosophy very well. I mean, when I was a graduate student, if you didn't have your own ism, you were a nothing, right? And how stupid is that? So there's about, you know, 58,000 different isms in philosophy floating around. And I do not care a fig about where I, you know, where I fit to any of them. I think we can do what scientists do, and that is talk about what they think is likely to be true. <laughs> I think that's okay. Next question. Um, so uh, you reported that being separated from social interaction in the beginning of life results in a decrease of oxytocin receptors. Is there any possibility to cause an increase, an increase of such re receptors, maybe even at an old age? That's a really interesting question, but bear in mind that the data that I showed you were data on mice. Uh, I think given how ancient and how deep the oxytocin story is that we would see it in humans too. Um, we don't really know how you might uh, change oxytocin receptor density. Um, I haven't seen any experiment on, on that. Although there have been, um, I think this was actually done in Larry Young's lab at Emory. I think they took loner mice and changed the gene, inserted the gene from uh, social mice and with the result that uh, the babies were born social. But um, how you could do it later in life, I don't know. How would you get them to the right place, for one thing? I mean, you couldn't just, you know, eat them. And I mean, they would denature in the gut. So I don't know. Next question. Uh, what about people that have a low sense of morality, like criminals? Do they have a lower level of oxytocin, in your opinion? No, that, they, um, that is a really, really interesting question. Um, and uh, the ones, of course, that we're most concerned with are the ones who really don't care, the sociopaths or the psychopaths. Uh, and it's not new whether or not they lack oxytocin receptors or whether in the course of learning, they just became very twisted and so forth. People have asked me this question about Trump. <laughs> And it's, it's not clear. What we do see, however, with regard to uh, psychopathology is that there is a degree of heritability. And that's the case even, you know, when the infant is separated from the parents at birth. So, so it seems quite strongly heritable. Um, and it may, involve all kinds of things. It could involve uh, lack of, of receptor density for oxytocin in the right places. It's not known. But one thing to bear in mind here is that in, in the case of many psychopaths, they have acquired at least the veneer of social skills. And some of them can be very uh, persuasive and very charming and uh, and so they've acquired some aspect of social skill, but seemingly without feeling any guilt or remorse or anything. I mean, they're certainly fascinating. And, um, but I think we don't know anything much about their brain chemistry. And I don't know if, if we even know enough about the, the genes to be able to say something about oxytocin receptors. But interesting question, no, no doubt, no doubt. So I'm skipping a few questions where I think you have uh, answered most of, uh, of them, let's say. And uh, the next question is, are there oxytocin receptors in the olfactory epithelium? We don't know about humans, but there certainly are in rodents, absolutely. And they do rely on smell, of course, to a huge extent. And, and knowing a lot uh, about other individuals. Rats, of course, can, can be very, uh, yeah. I mean, rats are very, very complicated. They're very different from mice. But um, 
Yeah, uh, it wouldn't surprise me that if if there are oxytocin receptors in human uh, olfactory epithelium, probably nothing like the density that you would see in in a rat or a dog, for example. Yeah. Uh, and the next one, how would you think we could go from oxytocin driven bonding to impartiality or fairness? It seems like uh, these moral concerns might not be easily accounted for under the oxytocin view. Indeed, strong social bonds with particular individuals will probably lead to partiality. Yeah, no, I think I think that's true, actually. I think that in-group bonding is very, very strong. And especially, for example, in, in adolescence and early adulthood, it, the bonding extends beyond the family to, to individuals in, in, in the group, and it is very strong. And I think something like recognizing fairness to all individuals is something that you really do have to learn. And, and kids have to have it explained to them, <laughs> you know, why in the long run it's actually in their interest to, to display fairness and politeness and so forth to all individuals. I mean, I'm sure all of us can remember times when we were, I don't know, 10, 12, even maybe 14 or older, when, you know, we were pretty ghastly to other kids. And it didn't seem that bad, um, but wise teachers or wise parents, or wise adults could say, look, you know, that's horrendous. You can't do that. And that's a form of punishment from people you like and care about. And that, that's part of learning. But, but the idea of fairness to extending to all is not an intuitive idea um, for, most, for most of us. Uh, most of us have to learn, learn that the way we have to, you know, learn geometry. You'd... Okay, so given that we have just one minute left, I think we will skip the last two questions. And uh, for, for your sake, maybe Pat, you'd like to have all the questions. I've skipped some of them, so we can send you the list. And uh... That would be very kind. Yes, I would like that. Yeah. So uh, it's time for us to thank you for the talk and for the marathon session of uh, the questions uh, you took well. So that's, that's very nice. Um, thank you to everyone also uh, for the people that have attended this uh, talk. So it was, uh, Thomas, it was 167 I saw, I think. Oh, I'm thrilled about that. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. Well, we are. I would well. so love to come to Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yes. would like that very much. Sometime, uh, sometime perhaps when all this is soon all enough, this, I hope. Yes. So thank you everyone and uh, take care and have a nice uh, day or evening depending on your time zone. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Pat. That was great. Everybody. Thank you, Thomas. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.